I'm fantastic. And thank you guys so much for having me. Uh, I'm, I'm actually really glad, in fact, to uh, be coming on right after your conversation uh, about Here Lies Love, because it really, it, it really underscores the degree to which so much of our, our hidden history is coming to light, how much of our recent nostalgia, I mean, I, I grew up during the actual events of <laughs> Here Lies Love, uh, before it became, the, you know, sort of a toe-tapping Broadway musical, and and here it is, <laughs> just because you know it's like my life as extravaganza, right? So uh, that that is is Asian America in real time, pretty much. It's a toe-tapping Broadway musical. It's also a jump up and down and dance your booty off musical because <laughs> you haven't seen it yet, have you? I have not. I've only seen. Oh, the, we're uh, going, clips Jeff. Of it, okay, yes. you're coming to <laughs> coming to New York. We're all gonna go. Me, you, and Rob. We're gonna be our opening night. It's a dance party. It's wild. So we're going to have fun. Um, <laughs> but it is wild, too. It's amazing. Like, we'll get into this. And I love that, you know, as you as a, you know, uh, a writer and, dare I say, historian, uh, mm -hmm. you know, of this context, like, this is part of, this is part of the story, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and that 10 years ago, it was off-Broadway. Some of us New York diehards saw it. Now it's had, like, multiple things around the, uh, in different cities, it's coming to Broadway, it's going to have a much more global presence. Mm -hmm. And that is part of this hi historic trajectory that I feel like America uh, is uh, embracing and going through that, you know, I'd love to get your insight on that. Yeah. Before we do, so can you tell us a little bit about like, your journey becoming a writer? And, and how did that where did that start for you? Was it, were you writing in the school newspaper? Were you <laughs> writing stories to your, you know, what, what, where did it all begin? Well, uh, as a child of, of Asian American immigrants, it as <clears throat> frequently as the case began with a, a very difficult conversation with my parents. <laughs> a very, uh, <laughs> that you weren't going to be a doctor or yeah. a lawyer. <laughs> I, I, I come from uh, a, a linear five generation string, uninterrupted string, of, of doctors and healers. And uh, I, as a result, sort of uh, not only interrupted that string, but uh, instantly became kind of the, the black sheep of my family. And um, at the same time, I will say that being afforded the, the indulgence in some ways of pursuing my dreams is something that could only have been possible if my parents in coming here uh, it had made enormous sacrifices. So I, I fully see their side of the story. And I am quite thankful now that uh, I my name has found its way into, you know, the World Journal, the Chinese language newspaper, so they can actually point to it and say, oh, you know, our son, he's not entirely a failure. Um, but uh, that all said, beginning as a writer was uh, just a moment of discovery that really occurred to me when I was at college. Uh, I had been volunteering for an organization in Boston called the uh, Asian American Resource Workshop. And I, I found this sort of dusty stack of uh, old publications from the, uh, the late 60s and early 70s. And, and these were uh, copies of a magazine called Bridge, which was the first Asian American publication, the first publication to try to speak to uh, members of the Asian diaspora in the United States in English. And, the amazing thing is all this was occurring just a few years after the coinage of the term Asian American. Uh, I, in, in reading this publication and looking at the history, I realized I was actually born in 1968. I'm you know, going to just show my age here. Uh, and that was the same year Asian America was born as an idea, as a political idea, as a construct to uh, embrace and connect people from very many different cultures, very different language groups and faiths who in Asia did not see themselves as in any way connected. But here in America, as members of a small minority, uh, they decided that there was both a need and an opportunity to create this identity of being Asian American. And as with many things, the purpose of, of inventing this idea of Asian America came from a small group of students uh, student activists in the Bay Area who wanted to stand in solidarity with Black Americans. They they literally needed a banner to march under in order to attend this rally uh, to free Black Panther leader Huey Newton. And so they looked to their Afro-American, uh, that was the language of the time, uh, student uh, peers and, and created a banner that said Asian American Political Alliance. 
And that was the first usage of the term Asian American. But by three years later, people were using it in magazines, people were using it in policy, people were creating laws that referenced Asian Americans. It was a very fast start, if you will, like a quick turn of the engine. And, and in the movement three began. years, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so as far as that, to my path of being a writer, I mean, once I discovered that there was this thing called Asian America, uh, it, it just sort of fascinated me. And I, I decided that I wanted to actually pursue writing about this community to which I belonged that I'd never really been exposed to when I was younger. My, I, I grew up in a very white part of New York City, uh, Staten Island. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Wu-Tang, though. <laughs> um, that was our Asian American representation. Uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, given that I, I wasn't really surrounded by a, a sort of multicultural environment, coming to college, finding this dusty box as part of this volunteering thing I was doing, and then deciding that I wanted to trace the outlines of what it mean, meant to be Asian American. That was actually the beginning point of, of my career as a writer and my avowed uh, desire to, to narrate in some ways and document Asian America. Wow, I I love that, and uh, it's nice to hear your. I'm I'm hailing from New York City right now. I'm from LA. We've switched coasts, so we have this camaraderie here. But that's so incredible, and you know, I couldn't help but think about you know the parallel of like the Black Lives Matter movement during COVID, right? You know, like we didn't. That wasn't a term, you know, that pop culture was aware mm -hmm. of, and then within one. And now let's say three years later, this is ingrained in the way we speak about things. Well, I mean, as a writer, the very first thing you have to affirm for yourself is that words matter, right? And the term Asian American, even, that was a term that existed not just in emulation of Afro-Americans, of Black Americans, African Americans, uh, but it was also a term that affirmed two things. One is that Asians belong together in some fashion, and that we are American, which we have to argue a lot. Like we are the one group it feels like we need to affirm our status as belonging here, much like the term Black Lives Matter is an affirmation that Black lives matter. You know, by stating that, you're really kind of pointing to the fact that all too often people don't think they matter. So the creation of these, these terms are political instruments in a lot of ways, but they're also kind of like literary figures, right? They're, they're metaphors and pointers to uh, deeper constructs that we need to actually analyze. You don't just say these phrases or these terms, you have to think what they mean in context. Yeah, absolutely. So I'd love to talk a little bit about uh, one of your many books. Uh, <laughs> so let's first, let's first talk about Rise, a pop history of Asian American, uh, Asian America from the 90s to now. Okay, so it was a New York Times bestseller, and it was also one of Barnes and Noble's best history books of 2022. So how did this book come about? And what was the impetus to start this book? And then what made you keep going to make sure because I know there's nothing harder potentially than writing a book as far as if you're going to have a job sitting at a computer. Writing is very, very hard if anyone's tried it. So how did you get the idea? Why did you want to write it? How'd you keep going? Well, the impetus uh, for writing it was something pretty similar to this in the sense that it was me and, and two friends of mine, uh, Phil Yu, Philip Wong, sitting on Zoom, you know, being unable to actually see each other face to face uh, during the pandemic, looking around us through this, this kind of weird periscope of uh, digital platforms and, and realizing that the world was uh, not like anything that we had ever seen in our own lifetimes. And that in that world, we were being, as Asian Americans, not just divided and separated by the pandemic itself and, and the lockdown, uh, but we were, we were being put into a circumstance where uh, the language being used by people at the very highest level of societies was condemning us, was, was um, you know, was putting uh, uh, us under a, a really terrible microscope and focusing uh, anger and rage and violence towards our community. And, you know, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. That's a, a, a saying which I've uh, really embraced with 
looking at at Rise uh, and the process of writing it, uh, we just realized that we'd seen this movie before and that in the past when political figures and public rhetoric was aimed at Asian Americans, it frequently uh, led to circumstances where we were excluded or rounded up and put in camps or otherwise our, our community was was decimated. And at the same time, we had made so much progress. We had, we had so much to celebrate. So the book on the one hand really wanted to uh, just remind people of the path that we had been on before this weird hiatus emerged, this viral hiatus, but also to almost like write down the blueprint to document how we got there in case we had to actually unearth it again and, and rebuild. And so RISE uh, covered the last three decades of our, our Asian American history. What I think is, it's almost like a, a bit of a cheat code to call ourselves historians because this is our lives. I mean, <laughs> we were all there for this and we were talking about these things mostly in first person, but that is our community. I mean, Asian America has been rising over these three decades uh, in a way that that we were fortunate enough to have front row seats at. And so we wrote the book collectively by kind of reaching back into our memories and talking to many of the people who influenced us and, and who shaped our community. Everybody was much more easy to reach because they were all sitting at home wondering what they should be doing too. <laughs> so the, the book very much came out of that, this this moment of uh, weird intimacy and distance that occurred during the pandemic. So what you're saying is I learned how to make sourdough bread and you wrote a very groundbreaking bestseller history book. Okay, cool. cool. So we were both, you know, working with rising in various ways. <laughs> exactly. Oh, good job. Picking up what I put down. Well done. Um, and, but I think it's so interesting to hear that, um, <clears throat> that you're, you know, you're talking about it, it's all this, it's lived experience, right? So is that one of the reasons why you chose to focus on the 90s rather than going back in history uh, so that you could speak from these personal experiences? Yeah, and at the same time, there is actually a, a window uh, or a reason for the window being so critical in some ways for Asian America's emergence out of invisibility and into at least the, the edge of the spotlight, right? Uh, what we realized when looking back was that if the beginning of Asian America as an idea, as a, a pan-Asian, pan-ethnic community was 1968, then the 90s, 2000s, and 2010s represented the time, the, the span in which the first people who were brought up and raised within Asian America, within that idea, were coming of age and moving into the real world, such as the real world was at the time. Uh, so... In the 90s, we saw the first kind of green shoots of uh, Asian Americans set against this idea of diversity, right? Uh, by the 2000s, people were talking about multiculturalism and saying that, yes, many different voices need to be lifted up. It's not just a matter of sprinkling a little color against a white background. We really do have to start thinking about multiple narratives. And then by the 2010s, people were talking about inclusion and this idea that it's not just about many parallel experiences, we all need to learn about each other. We, we need to have Asian American experiences that are centered for everybody and not just for our own respective communities. And you see that those three decades, uh, those three kind of cohorts of individuals, people who grew up, like myself, mostly children of immigrants, but drawing from a deep history of, of our Asian history in America, uh, essentially through each of those chapters, just finding footholds and eventually kind of breaking ground and then reaching back and pulling people forward. That's the story we document across a wide range of different industries and, and areas uh, of, of uh, kind of creative achievement. Uh, so it, it was not truly coincidence that we focus on these three decades. These three, three decades were pivotal in so many different ways to getting us where we are today. Absolutely. And it makes me think, too, uh, you know, there's other there's been other moments like this in our culture right now. You know, Fresh Off the Boat takes place in the 90s of a kid coming of age. I know with, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is like these are, you know, the writers are, you know, the creators are watching like this is this was part of their lived experience. And now it is, you know, it's a wildly successful show. 
Yeah. Um, and, you know, again, uh, for those who don't know, uh, my son Hudson Yang starred in Fresh Off the Boat as Eddie, <laughs> Eddie Huang. Uh, but it's remarkable because I remember going to the, the um, after party, right? After the pilot was shot, uh, where they just had a you know gathering in Chinatown in, in Los Angeles, uh, invited a whole bunch of people, people from other studios as well. And I was standing by the hors d'oeuvres. That's where you need to stand at these things. Uh, and somebody came up to me uh, and introduced himself as an exec from another studio and, and said to me, hey, that's your, that's your kid, right? He's great. You know, we're all really looking at this show and, and crossing our fingers. I mean, hoping that it actually breaks through because we have so many Asian American projects in the pipeline. We would love to be able to bring out to the world. And if this show hits, then we'll be able to do that. I almost dropped my, my plate because what he was actually saying just straight out in the open was that there were plenty of stories that could be told, but people are waiting for something to break through first to kind of take that first hit in, in some ways, be that first hit before they would actually push them forward, before they would actually kind of unleash the hounds. And it, it's, it just reminded me that things move very fast once they start moving, but it does take, at least for fast following industries like Hollywood, somebody else proving that it's possible first. So after Fresh Off the Boat, you saw Constance Wu, you know, just emerge as a superstar. After that, Crazy Rich Asians became possible. After Crazy Rich Asians became possible, you saw dozens of, of projects just proliferating from there. Uh, one of them uh, by Adele Lim, who was the writer of Crazy Rich Asians, uh, and who brought writers from Fresh Off the Boat uh, to write a film called Joyride, which is coming out in July. And I'll tell you, having seen that film, uh, it is it was instantly kind of like my favorite Asian American movie <laughs> because <laughs> it upends so many of our tropes. It is so body. It is so uh, just groundbreakingly kind of debauched and hilarious that I could not keep my jaw from hitting the ground every few seconds while watching it. So that's where we are. I mean, in a sort of brief period, because these opportunities have been made available we have seen a transformation in, in the way we can sort of share our narratives. And it all comes from this, this truth, Viola Davis said it long ago, right? That it's never for want of talent, it's always for want of opportunity that we don't actually get a chance to shine. Oh my gosh, so true. Uh, was there ever a time when Eddie was like, what is this, did you help him? When like, <laughs> what is this thing? And it's like something in the 90s that we would all know. And there's like plenty of jokes to the audience about that, but was there an education for you for helping your son out a little bit when he was like, what, what, are they, what is this thing? I, you know, the funny thing is uh, Hudson ended up getting cast in part because he came home from school one day and just announced he wanted to be on TV. And actually, I, I switched gears into Asian dad mode, you know, remembering all the things my dad told me when I said I wanted to be a writer and kind of said to him, oh, you know, it's a really tough road to, to hoe. Um, if you want to do it, just remember, I have a lot of friends who are Asian, you know, Asian American actors and they're fantastic bartenders, uh, all the stuff <laughs> you say. And then uh, he goes in, does this open audition, rolls out of there, you know, and his like we find ourselves on a plane to Hollywood. And the first thing that, uh, that he tells me as we're kind of landing in, in Los Angeles uh, is, you know, dad, I, just, I was just remembering that lecture he gave me. Uh, I thought you said this was going to be hard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, that's why they cast you boy. Um, anyway. Uh, <laughs> Confidence. Yeah. What's yeah. That? yeah. So, <laughs> swag is a thing, right? Um, swag. But, you know, I, for what it's worth, I mean, this really does speak to the reason not only I co-wrote Rise, but why I wrote The Golden Screen, which is coming out mm -hmm. in October. Uh, it's, it's a book that looks back at 140 films, uh, Asian films, Hollywood films featuring Asians, Asian American independent films, and kind of documents the ways in which these points of connection and evolution have, have uh, just shaped not just the way we see ourselves, but the way the, the world sees us. Mm. If it had not been for Fresh Off the Boat, a TV show, not a movie, uh, but if it had not been for Fresh Off the Boat being in the center of people's screens, right? Just telling people that Asian American families exist, that these cultures, uh, even though we haven't seen them, 
are not really as different from yours and you know from from those of, of other groups as one might expect that that level of normalization did so much i think even to not just give more opportunity but insulate us a little bit from some of the worst uh impact of of the hostility and xenophobia that emerged uh, emerged during the pandemic and mm. um that's that's what this is about in some ways you know when i say that history doesn't repeat itself but it definitely rhymes you know to use that mm -hmm. word, you, you look back at this sort of pop culture history of ours and you see that on the one hand all the stereotypes that exist today they began back in the 1800s in the 1940s these are artifacts of uh war in many cases of of you know uh, a language designed to either keep us out or make it easier to kill us, right? And those stereotypes just filtered into Hollywood and became a, a part of the lens through which Asian Americans have been seen for for decades and decades. But people have worked against it to change it, and people have finally gotten to a point where we have agency to tell our own stories. And those stereotypes are now being both disrupted. Uh, reinvented and in some cases upended entirely uh, and, you know, uh, turned into humor. And that's the process by which I think our continued sort of existence in America <laughs> is, is always made possible, not just for Asian Americans, but for all of our communities. Yeah. So you mentioned, so your new book, The, the, the Golden Screen, the movies that made uh, Asian America. So it spans a hundred years, like you were just sharing with us. Was there um, some fact or, or some bit of history in there that you discovered in your research that was especially surprising. I'm sure there were many. Oh yeah, there is. Um, there's a movie uh, and a from 1915, actually the silent era, uh, called The Cheat, and it starred Sesu Hayakawa, a Japanese American. Uh, actor, one of our earliest, who was actually one of the biggest screen stars of his era, one of the, the most iconic representatives of the sort of silent screen uh, chapter of Hollywood. And he was seen as, as so incredibly sexy, so incredibly charismatic and sensual that when he appeared on screen, uh, women would literally swoon in the aisles. They actually had to do a, an announcement before screenings of the cheat saying, uh, if you are faint of heart, uh, you may you may wish to, you know, <laughs> fan yourself as you might get vapors from seeing this this man appear on screen. He was like a rock uh, star. He was uh, he was a rock star before rock existed, right? Yeah. <laughs> but he he was in the ch in the movie The Cheat. He had to actually be framed not as sort of a romantic or or even kind of you know, ex mysterious uh, central hero, he had to be the villain. Uh, and he had to be kind of presented as this malicious, manipulative temptation source that would, of course, eventually get his comeuppance, not just because uh, of, of kind of social taboos, but eventually because there was a, a, a code that Hollywood enacted called the Hayes Code that actually made it uh, impossible to have uh, white women or white men be seen on screen as romantic partners of, of non-white people. And so that kind of changed his whole career. He, he never really uh, got roles that truly demonstrated his full range and his full capacity. Uh, I often wonder what it would have been like for generations of Asian men in the United States if Sesu Hayakawa had actually gotten the the ability to kind of be the, you know, that sort of dashing romantic hero that his career always begged for him to, to be, you know, come, uh, and that Hollywood racism prevented from him from, from uh, ever portraying. And that stigma lingers to this day of, you know, of, of Asian men not being like a sexual object that is still slowly breaking down, you know, it makes me think of uh, my uh, my friend and I'm a big fan of Daniel Isaac, who got to be a romantic person in um, in the other two, right? And there's a yeah. white guy and a, a you know uh, um, a a a a a a p i folk you know mm -hmm. couple, and it's like, wait, have we not seen this on TV before? Is this really <laughs> the first time I'm seeing you know, <laughs> this happen between two men on television ever? Like a kiss, romance, <laughs> all all of it? It was like. 
this is just a couple of years ago, you know, it's still happening. I, I have frequently said that the time we will know we've finally arrived is when we stop having firsts, right? Mm. When we stop actually saying, oh, that person's a pioneer, the, the debut to actually accomplish X, Y, and Z. Um, but while we're still there, you know, it's important for us to call out the fact that a lot of these things are happening for the first time still in our lifetime. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. So we only have a couple minutes left. I could talk to you all day, clearly. So just text me your phone number. I'll give you a call every five Absolutely. minutes and we'll chat. And, uh, <laughs> but looking ahead, where do you see diverse representation in pop culture from like five years from now, 10 years from now, right? Mm -hmm. We just had the, the Academy Awards. We just saw this flood of awesome, awesome, uh, you know, work coming through from, you know, the whale, RRR, everything, everywhere, all at once, of course, sweeping. You know, what, what do you see for the next, you know, if you, it, in Jeff Yang's, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> crystal ball and your future, what, what do you hope to see? So I actually am going to turn the clock back another year and look at uh, the year in, in which a film from Korea actually shocked the world by winning a whole ton of awards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that film was Parasite by uh, mm -hmm. Bong Joon-ho. And the reason why I'm going to call him out first is because he had this really just brilliant and, and hilarious quote about how uh, in his acceptance speech, uh, the thing that Americans need to do is to find a way to get over that, that you know, sort of one inch high uh, boundary of subtitles in order to see the world, right? Uh, and... <laughs> He was talking about language, obviously. He was talking about his film being in Korean and uh, that the incredible acting performances uh, of the people there not getting shine, not getting awarded because people were reading the movie as opposed to hearing it firsthand and, and not really recognizing the kind of talent that was uh, being exhibited on screen as a result. Uh, but that notion of subtitles and the need for subtitles and subtitles being... A handicap for people to actually see deeper into worlds that don't they don't actually belong to is equally true for culture and for uh for identity as it is for language and what i mean by that is i think for the longest time asian american movies have always kind of had to have subtitles in the sense that there was a character who'd come on screen and point to something and say what's that you're doing you know what is it <laughs> explain to me that food um we're finally getting to a point where I don't think those subtitles are as necessary. And the movies that are coming out that I've seen in the next year, the next couple of years are all complicated and nuanced and layered. And they're telling stories without that preemptive need to pre-explain what they're doing. That to me, I think is, is incredible. Uh, and everything everywhere all at once and the movies that have proceeded since then, they're all movies that to me, show that the world is ready for a world that isn't dependent on subtitles. Oh, I look forward to that. I hope it happens. I hope you're right. Jeff, this has been so fantastic. Thank you for making the time today. Big fan of you, big fan of Hudson. Um, give a shout out. Uh, how can folks um, stay connected with you, reach out, and where can they get your book? All the things. Uh, I am actually dropping right now into the chat uh, a link for uh, a discounted pre-order of the golden screen it's coming out october 31st uh it's 20 dollars instead of 40 dollars i arranged this with my publisher for this event and uh if you want to follow me i'm uh original spin on most social media platforms uh but i'm i'm always willing to come back here and and talk to you guys thank you so much for for uh inviting me to power to fly and and for having such a great conversation